Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. And this movie, I too want to live in a society where vampires can be free and authentic to themselves and who they were. There's a lot of routes you could go to to kind of communicate this message of self-acceptance, kind of being caught between worlds. Why vampires in particular? Yeah, yeah. Well, it became important to me, um, first off, to tell a story about feeling in between identities. I grew up Mexican American and bisexual and did struggle a lot with not knowing exactly where I belonged and feeling in between the worlds. So that element became important. But for Val, I wanted to make her Mexican and queer, but for those elements to be celebrated and normalized and not the conflict of the story. So for me, this monster world and monster stories in general have always really related to me as being an outsider story of being feared and misunderstood And I thought it would be a perfect vehicle for Val to explore and sort of have these same themes and revelations through this monster realm. Mm -hmm. And in that self-exploration, she also is caught in another conundrum in that either sometimes when these discovery stories, you're trying to hide who you are, but she has someone who she actually wants to, to reveal herself to, which is also a problem because she's got family saying, no, 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 no. You must keep under this. Is that an experience that you've had as well with uh, shaping this story? Oh, totally. I mean, uh, for me and my personal experience, you know, I didn't come out until much later in life. And so hiding that part of myself, there were plenty of people that I, I wanted to share that with, but I, I hadn't fully accepted myself in those moments yet. And I had to get to the point of that to be able to accept myself. And, you know, I think it's such a special thing when, we are able to take every element of ourselves and, and just feel so fully who we are and be free in that. And it's a journey and it's still a journey I'm going on. I think even doing this project and being a part of Launchpad was such a pivotal point of my own journey of self-acceptance that mm-hmm. I'll always look back at Launchpad as this like really incredible time in my own personal growth and, and be thankful for that. That's funny. I'm glad you said that with your own personal growth with that. Now that putting your story on display, it's like giving birth. And now you have all these people outside of your immediate network who will see these things and learn about you and learn about the film. Is it like a birth-like feeling? Is it a feeling of peace? How do you feel now after going on the journey, creating the story to celebrate the journey and now sharing it with a mass amount of people? Oh, 100%. Filmmaking in general is such a vulnerable experience. And I think For all of us filmmakers in this program, we made the story so personal to us that that it is kind of sharing ourselves with the world when this when this comes out. And especially on a platform like Disney Plus, it can feel a bit intimidating. But I think that's also the beauty of, you know, allowing everyone to see your vulnerability and who you really are, because in that way, it inspires others to be true to themselves and to have strength and in fully being happy with who they are and, and expressing themselves and it connects us in a in a way and in general all of the other filmmakers we all had such different stories to tell but they all were uniformly around a similar theme that we all became very bonded through that mm-hmm. through throughout that bonding how does that change you or elevate you as filmmakers when you're able to be in this community where you're all reaching a goal but not in competition with each other because you're all part of the same program. How does that foster that creativity and growth as a filmmaker for you personally? It's, it's huge. I think that a creative community is so huge in continuing your own journey as a filmmaker. And that was one of the most special and surprising things of this program. I didn't realize I'd come out with it with five new best friends and creative collaborators that I can always have and call on. And from the beginning, we even formed Uh, a story trust to where every week we would bring in our scripts and our updates and sort of get each other's ideas engaged and whatever else. And and it really just elevated all our stories and and pushed us creatively and 
I, I'm so happy to have each of them. And we still have a check, text chain that we talk to each other and <laughs> check in with each other. Um, and that community was something I, I wasn't expecting, uh, but I'm so happy I have now. That's awesome. I love the lightheartedness of this story, even though it was very insightful and about growth and discovery, it was still light and it was still fun and it made me smile while it educated. Thank you so much, Anne Marie, for your film. It was lovely and I appreciate talking to you. Oh, great. It was great talking to you. Take care. Aksa, thank you so much for your film. Ia Mubarak to you, fresh off of Ramadan. Terrific timing for this film to come out. <laughs> thank you. That means a lot. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Uh, it's funny when you have children together in a new environment, you have one that's older, one that's younger, and it seems like the younger ones always have that adaptability just a little bit easier, that courageousness a little bit easier than the older sister. What were the origins of this for you um, to bring the story to light and trying to navigate having your your culture that's been in your home and in a new environment? Yeah, that's for sure. I immigrated here when I was like 21 turning 22 uh, alone. Like I didn't immigrate with my family. So I was alone. I didn't have a community. And I, every Eid, the Eid that I celebrated growing up that I looked forward to and it was such a big deal, all of a sudden became like such a lonely time for me here, you know, and nobody around me even knew what it was, let alone like them wishing me or, you know, so it was such a lonely time. And I just felt so alone in this new home that I was supposed to call home, you know, and, um, and around that time also, like I was, I wanted to go out and talk about Eid, but I'm like, who's listening? Who cares at this point? So I kind of was like Zainab in a, or Z in a way where I was like, assimilating trying to assimilate so hard and trying to just make it okay that I don't celebrate it either I don't take off days off for it you know and as I grew older I realized like I just can't suppress that side of me it's home it's roots and the more I try to disconnect from my roots the more I was dying you know mm -hmm. and I realized like I have to just start accepting who I am I have to start educating people about who I am and so in a way I have gone from Z to Amina <laughs> Mm -hmm. And now I'm like telling people about Eid um, used through this film and also making also finally because of this film, I've been getting so many like people who have been part of this film so wishing me Eid Mubarak, you know, uh, my non-Muslim friends, my non-Muslim colleagues. And it just feels like I'm finally home. Like it just feels like I completed my journey, you know, in a strange way, that part at least. That's beautiful. What do you think is a tipping point for the for young people when it comes to sharing who they are between not hold, not wanting to share anything. We have these two sisters who, like we mentioned, navigating you came when you're older and it was a different type of journey. But with young people, what is that tipping point between, oh, this is cool and mm, it's too different. I don't want anyone to know. I think it's a, it's your environment and surrounding. Like Amina's, Amina could have easily been like, oh, if Z doesn't want me to do it, maybe it's not cool and maybe I shouldn't talk about it. Maybe I shouldn't make a petition um, and I should just shut down myself and be like her. But that's her spirit in her. Just told her that was the wrong thing to do, you know? And it's her love for her sister is what even makes her to start the petition. It's not a selfish act. It's an act because she knows how much Eid meant to her sister back home. So maybe if she can bring Eid to this new home, her sister can become like the old self. So in that mm -hmm. sense, like she never wanted to do this for herself. It was more about for her sister and for themselves, for them together. So I feel like the tipping point, like, yeah, Amina could have easily, there could have been a version of the story where Amina could have easily been like, okay, I guess I should also be like my sister and assimilate. But that spirit in her, the grit in her always told her like, no, I need to go and educate myself. And then she does like her entire class accepts her for who she is and makes, makes it special for her, even though she doesn't get what she wants. Like, Eid is never going to be a public holiday because of her petition. And uh, mm -hmm. Zainab is going to be Z, but at least she has to accept that aspect. But she has to accept the new things that are going to come with this new home. But at the same time, her new home is accepting her for who she is. It was beautiful. Ultimately, for those who don't who don't know or don't celebrate, when Ramadan is over, you give a gift to all your family and your loved ones. So is it safe to say that this was her ultimate Ramadan gift to give to her sister, that ability to enjoy it and, and feel free and celebrate it again? 
Exactly. It's her to her being like, you know, you're not going to want to celebrate Eid the way it was back home. And that's OK. I want you to just be yourself. And her sister is able to dance in front of everybody and showcase her dance, not the, not the origin that she wanted to do with her, her classmates, you know. So in a way, yeah, she did give her sister this freedom to just be herself and her accepting her sister as Z. That was the biggest gift she has to give her sister that she's going to still love her regardless of who she is going to become. Absolutely. Beautiful film. Thank you so much. Um, I have lots of Muslim friends who celebrate. So I truly, truly enjoyed this to see another perspective. Thank you for your talent. Thank you. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much. It's so a pleasure to speak with you. Dinner is served. I can relate to this so much when people put you in a box and they want to keep you in that box until you step out. What is the origin story for you? And was it a matter of someone trying to keep you inside of a box that you desperately wanted out of? Right, I mean, isn't that like a theme to like pretty much all my like entire life? <laughs> like I felt like, you know, like I've been growing up, you know, always moving, right? So I was born in this Northern Gobi Desert area of China. And then I came to, and then I moved to like the Southern coast of China where they speak Cantonese and I only spoke Mandarin at the time and I was bullied a lot at the time. And then I moved to New York, Boston, LA, and now I'm in Beijing, China. And mm -hmm. like literally the more I moved, the more I felt, you know, I like when people ask me the question, where's home, where are you from? I, I like struggle to answer that question because I'm lost about who I am and where I belong. And like to like like what you're saying, you know, like especially in the U.S. When I first moved to the U.S., I felt that you know I wanted to fit in. I felt that I wanted to as, as, assimilate, and that need to to becoming part of this you know like different world, almost like it's kind of like a boss that I gave myself in a way, right? And then slowly you started to realize, you know, like there are cultural differences. Um, but then the decision will be like, would you try to hide that differences or would you try to embrace it, right? Embrace your own identity. Mm -hmm. What I, speaking to you now and the other creators who've been part of the Launchpad program, these are some very deeply personal stories that have caused all of you to grow and stretch as filmmakers and storytellers by revealing some uh, very personal things like this to you about your own journey of trying to find your place. How has this opened you up and helped you evolve as a filmmaker? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I felt, you know, I always ask me that question, like, you know, where, who you are right like where where do you belong and it's not only about you know being like a being chinese being asian it's also like what does it mean to be a man right like what, what does masculinity mean and like there's so many aspects of you know identity that you know i'm still trying to explore and trying to get an answer and for me filmmaking is that process or almost like a therapy for me to you know, learn or explore myself in a way, you know? So that's why like all my stories are about characters trying to find their place. Mm -hmm. Speaking with the other filmmakers, um, they all mentioned that you all have this beautiful kind of like a little community now where you still communicate, you're able to run things by each other. It's not, it's refreshing that it's not competitive because it really is, a common goal of making each other better. Is that your experience as well, participating yes, with the other filmmakers? Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, like, cause for me, I think, you know, filmmaking is such a tender, you know, process. And, you know, like, especially with the six of us, we all tell very personal stories. And be, like you, the, the, the thing that makes you able to do that is you need to share vulnerability and discover mm -hmm. each other's vulnerability. And, in order to do that, you have to create a protective space, a safe space that we're all embracing, you know, you know, each other and we're all protecting each other. So for me, that is definitely, you know, like, uh, like, like my, my family, you know, like, even though we were different, we were from different culture, we tell different stories, but then just 
how they try to, you know, how, how we try to protect each other, it's invaluable. Mm -hmm. And lastly, the song that gets belted out and, and it has some very, very strong meanings. Was that a jumping off point for you or how did that song make it into the mix? Of the film right i mean the song is always uh, has always been there from from the beginning because i well like I, I i forgot to tell you this but like this story is based on my own true experience which i actually i did sing a very awkward song in mandarin chinese <laughs> but then it's a different song but then this song like because for me you know embracing yourself in a different culture takes a lot of courage and that's why I really wanted to have a very strong song with a very strong lyrics that pretty much have the character embrace himself, embrace his own voice, almost with a rebellion action, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, it was wonderful. I enjoyed your project so much as the other films. Thank you for your time today. And this is just a very beautiful film and I look forward to seeing your next work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Moxie, I really loved your film. It was so tender and warm. And I love how children have this ability to see each other without all of the other noise and things that go on around them. What was the origin of bringing these two lovely young actors together and, and this story in general? Thank you so much. I, you know, I wrote the story um, sort of based on what happened to me as a child. I was uh, best friend with this other kid and his dad was starting to have a problem with me being like feminine and like not conventionally masculine. And I think to your point, it is true that sometimes I felt like, why was, why was my friend okay with me, but his dad was not. And I started to like th real, really think about this question and how children um, have that innocence and like the unfiltered sort of acceptance um, of, of their friends for who they are. And I think a lot of times we are taught by society on like different notions of judgments and like uh, sort of like exclu ex excluding certain type of people, um, I think by coming back to like the children's point of view, we are seeing it crystal clear that they are who they are and they can love each other without any of those prejudgments. Mm -hmm. What was particular move, particularly moving to me is sometimes in that wanting to be seen, it's even more difficult by the people who look just like you. If you are slightly different compared to society not seeing you if you're different from whatever the majority is, whatever that may be, to going even deeper within your own respective communities and people not seeing the differences. Do you think that is more hurtful at, than society as a whole not seeing you or not being seen within your own community? I think they're both very damaging. Um, I, I definitely, I see your point of like how that when someone close is like rejecting you, it, it can feel more personal and hurtful. Um, definitely, I think that was the moment um, that really sort of made me wake up to like realize that like I could, you know, cause trouble and the, so, the quote unquote trouble is also like a result of the society. Um, I, so I think they are kind of related, like um, the, the person who rejected me or judged me was also a result of the societal uh, trauma that he experienced. And he was just a, a cog that like is passing by that judgment. By telling this story and it being personal to you, do you have a feel? What is your feeling as it now becomes available for people to watch? Is it a freeing feeling, a nervous feeling? How do you feel anticipation of a wider audience getting ready to see it? I'm feeling very proud. I'm, very, I'm feeling very, very proud. I know that we've been 
talking about being out and proud for many, many years now and what it really means. I think from the beginning, it was like a statement, like we are brave. We are like, you know, doing something so groundbreaking to be out and proud. But I think now people are thinking being out and proud should be a given. We should be allowed to basically be ourselves. We shouldn't be apologetical. We shouldn't be like, oh, I'm finally out, I'm proud. I'm being coy about it. We should just like claim it. This is basically who I am. So I'm out, I'm proud. And mm -hmm. I'm out proud for the film to be seen by many. It's, a, it's beautiful. And lastly, how did this even come together for you in Disney Launchpad? There's a phenomenal slate of films, yours included, and they've all been very moving. How did that even come together for you to be able to release a film? It's been a wild journey. <laughs> I think Launchpad is very, very supportive. Um, they like, you know, recruit the six of us and we, are, we started to workshop. We loved each other's story immediately. But then we were we faced uh, COVID and we couldn't shoot for a couple of months until we figure out how to shoot safely. Um, so, but the six that's really, really bonded together. And we had like really great mentorship who like really like my mentor, Karen Chow and Sarah uh, Shepherd, shout out to them, really, really guide me through this. And so I am really grateful and I feel like it's the perfect transition for me from like an independent filmmaker to a filmmaker that can make studio films. Absolutely. Why well, thank you so much. This was just so sweet. And the, your actors were just darling. And I was so taken <laughs> with them and their ability to bond and the sweetness. Thank you so much for your film. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. Stephanie, this is such a beautiful film. I was so touched and it made me think about my own feelings of parent loss and grief and how we process those things. And I look at your little young star and children's abilities to, to open us and allow us space to communicate without judgment. What is that quality that, that children have that allow us to do that? Oh gosh, you know, they're just really open in ways that I think we we stop being, which is a little bit of what the lead character is going through, a fear of sharing, a fear of, of not being heard in some way. And I think kids don't really have that, you know, they're, they're little open, loving things. I remember when I was babysitting when I was in my early 20s, and it was really the first time I felt that kind of love. And this was, you know, someone else's kid, but they're, they're, so available to you and at some point he was just like crawling on me like I was a jungle gym and I had this thought like whoa this is love this is what love feels like um yeah that beautiful young person so that is the jumping off the origin of how this story came to be and mm -hmm. and where is that little that little one now who inspired this this great work from you I mean, he's like a teenager. And at some point I did tell his parents that that he was part of the inspiration for this film. So I think he'll find out soon enough that he is uh, in it in some way because I'm talking about him in interviews all the time. But I also have a nephew um, who was about three at the time. He's about to turn four and he's also in there. He has some lines. I keep trying to tell him like, you have lines in my film, isn't that cool? And he loves Disney Plus because he loves cars. like so much um but he doesn't quite get it yet but i'm gonna be the cool aunt one day <laughs> you, he's you're gonna be the cool aunt just by accident one day he's gonna call you up like now i understand what you I were telling me before <laughs> yeah let's be tigers tigers is such a regal beast it's not the king of a jungle but still a regal beast all the same how did you settle on that for a uh, for a title was your young man always tigering at you when you guys spent your time together you know, uh, no, it was a much longer process. It, it had a different title to begin with. And my mentor was like, it's not good. <laughs> and so I actually um, kept trying to think of what to call it. I, I actually think at some point there were a lot of other animals, but truly when we were doing auditions, a lot of kids say their favorite animal is tigers. I don't know why. I think the real truth is the, 
is let's be tigers is about saying let's be brave or let's play or let's remember why we live let's be strong you know um you're just sort of formed out of the out of the writing of the script mm -hmm. in keeping with the the disney tradition the watching the arc of the story made me cry made me happy and smile made me feel a lot of things participating on the lot in the launch pad section here of Disney. How has that helped you as a filmmaker and how did that connection happen for you? Oh my gosh, it's just been learning experience after learning experience. I mean, even now we're doing a press junket. Look at me go. <laughs> I've never done this before. It truly was like soup to nuts, a learning experience. Um, and so incredibly supportive. And I'm so grateful to the team that made the program. Um, and part of that was we had mentorship, which I mentioned, and we had each other, which is such a rare opportunity to make a film with a studio for the first time with a community of five other filmmakers. Um, so I'm, I'm just really grateful for, for getting to go through this process with them and, and with all of the support. Mm -hmm. And lastly, when you had the opportunity to see the full thing back, did you cry? How do you react to seeing your own work? Sometimes people have trouble watching their own work back. Yeah, it's I, I'm like scared to watch it again. I haven't watched it in a few months and I feel anxious about seeing it again. It's hard not to, um, it's hard to let yourself be an audience member to your own work for sure. But I've cried. I mean, they're so good. I, I, I can get taken away by the actors for sure and, and kind of fall in love. I love that moment when you're watching your own work and you kind of forget for a second and you're just in it. So I, hopefully I'll feel that way next time I see it when it premieres. Well, I definitely did. This is a, a lovely film and I cried many a tear watching it. It is just beautiful. Thank you so much for your time, Stephanie. You too. Take care. Hello to both of you. These films, I loved each and every one of them. They all touched me in different ways and they were all relatable and I enjoyed all these stories that were so deeply personal to these filmmakers. Mahim, beginning with you, um, working in diversity and inclusion, how did you find these filmmakers in particular to include them um, with the Disney's Launchpad program? So great question. Nice to meet you, Deandra. So uh, we really did a kind of multi-pronged approach to get to our um, six filmmakers and find them. So we had a public application um, where we received over 1,100 applications. And uh, we knew this was a brand new program. So it was really important to get the word out uh, so it's very grateful to have the partnership of Karen Chow, who is one of our creative executive mentors and um, was instrumental in getting the program off the ground. So um, she reached out to over 100 uh, film schools, nonprofits, uh, community organizations, all to get the word out since we were brand new. And interestingly, a fun fact, um, word of mouth was our number one referral source which shows how strong the community really is. Um, because in addition to that, we're very lucky to partner um, with one of our own teams uh, led by Delaney Mihoff uh, to do a social ad campaign. And uh, very smartly, their team targeted LinkedIn profiles all around directors, producers um, to help get the word out. Um, and so kind of, tried a very multi-layered approach to get us to where we are today and I'm very grateful um, that that got us to work with these six really, really talented filmmakers. They're super talented and really, really willing to share some very personal insights into who they are. Philip, when you have these filmmakers sharing, was that the common thread, the goal for these all to be so deeply personal to all the filmmakers that you selected or did it just sort of happen that way? You know, I, I would say it's probably an alchemy of, of both, you know, both things that you're saying there. I think when a filmmaker really dives deep, tells something that's really true and authentic to them, puts themselves on the page, I think that work resonates. And I think it undoubtedly resonated through the application process for season one. 
Um, and so I think, you know, that's just become something that's truly been championed. And I think, you know, Mahin can speak to it, but I know that, you know, just personal stories has always been, you know, something that we, you know, we've sought after with intention, but I, I really do just have to credit the filmmakers for going there and being bold. And, um, and then I'm really thankful that, you know, through this program, Disney has really picked up and, and stood behind those narratives. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, speaking with all of the different filmmakers this morning, they all mentioned how, in addition to the great mentorship that they received from Disney, working in community with each other was so gratifying and they still communicate mm-hmm. and they're able to reach these common goals without it being competition, but true authentic feedback and and love of the work and bringing it forward. Was that, how do you build that into the, the mentoring that it's important for them to talk to not only their mentors, their, their peers as well, Mahi? Uh, so one of my favorite quotes is uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> and so I think a blessing for me was getting to uh, build a community without even knowing it. And um, part of that is exactly what you're talking about, where we had 20 um, classes led by American Film Institute and our partners, and that became a way to um, essentially break bread together because we'd start with supper and then uh, build that community through the classes. And um, our directors were very inspired by the Pixar Story Trust, the Walt Disney Animation Story Trust, where they all collaborate and are not competitive to make the most beautiful art possible. So uh, they're very inspired and they created their own Story Trust um, from day one. And um, that has been just such a blessing to see in season one. Um, Philip, anything you'd like to add? I mean, I just think that they, it's, in, it's in their heart. I think a lot of that has to come down to the selection process. And I think um, the, the spirit of this program, which has really been nurtured by Mahin and which I take great pride in and take quite seriously fostering for season two of the program. But um, I think this film program was brought together with a lot of love and you know filmmakers were brought in who really just had that capa- that capacity and then um Mahin has just really been intentional about just leading with that example and I think it's just like in the bones and in the DNA of what we do this is a program that's about community and love and I have to say um this industry is a tough place you know there's a lot of people who are competing at you know outside of our doors and our vision is that this this program launchpad just always continues to be a respite and a, a nurturing place for artists. Absolutely. Well, I thank you both for your time. A wonderful first season, wonderful uh, films. Mahi Ian Mubarak to you, and thank oh, you thank all you. for your time today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Chandra. Thank you. Bye-bye. Shake your booties for black girl nerds.